Tonight it's my pleasure to introduce Omar, Omar Lopez Chahoud, an independent curator based here in New York who, since its inception in 2012, has been artistic director and curator of Untitled Art Fair in Miami and also now in San Francisco. Omar has curated and co-curated numerous exhibitions in the United States and internationally, including um, the Nicaraguan Biennial in 2014, Dynasty at the Hotel Particulier here in New York City in 2013, 4 minutes 30 seconds in 2012 at Legal Art in Miami, and New York Prague 6 at Futura Contemporary Arts in uh, Prague. Also Lush Life, which spanned nine galleries in New York, and The Pipe and the Flow at Espacio Minimo in Madrid. Omar's participated in panel discussions at many institutions, including Artist Space, Art in General, Moment with PS1, the Whitney Museum of American Art. He was a guest critic at Art Oh My in 2007. He's currently a member of the Bronx Museum's Acquisitions Committee, and he's written essays for several publications, including catalogs for Dynasty in 2006 and Rewind Recast Review in 2005, and also the Bronx Museum's Taking Aim, the Business of Being an Artist Today published in 2011. Omar received Masters of Fine Arts degrees from Yale and the Royal Academy in London, and he recently joined our faculty here in the MFA Fine Arts Department at the School of Visual Arts. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Omar Lopez Chahut. I wish being a curator would be just curating and visiting artists' at studios, but we also have to get involved in all the other uh, social activities that are part of this and, and takes up a lot of energy, but it's the only way we can promote and be part of a system that leads me to the art fair system. Many of you would think, and I have heard from artists saying that art fairs, oh God, is like seeing your parents uh, having sex. I, some artists... <laughs> Uh, said that once, I forgot which artist. Uh, but I think it's different because um, some artists do enjoy going to art fairs and I honestly, I don't think any, anything is wrong with uh, the art fairs because it brings not only the art together, it brings people together, it's a platform and it brings also not for profits and that's why I'm very much interested in this uh, conversation and it leads to good things most of the time, not only to sales, but also to uh, connections, so it facilitates connections to artists, uh, to curators, to, you know, it's, it's, it's part of what we do and, and we cannot just limit ourselves to one thing. I do come from the not-for-profit sector, as many of you know. Uh, I started out as an independent curator here in New York, I curated in many, many spaces, artist space, uh, art in general, when back in the days when it was near uh, Chinatown, um, Smack Mellon. Uh, so I understand the not for profit, and most of the time we do it because we believe in doing these things, because there's not really uh, much of a, a rewarding kind of, uh, in the sense of monetary compensation but we believe in, in this community that uh, that is who we are and that's how we get involved. Uh, and I sort of go between the two, between the not-for-profit and the for-profit, so-called so, so so, for-profit, which is the commercial galleries and the art fairs. Uh, I have curated in commercial galleries as well and I continue doing it. And um, as Mark mentioned, I did a show back, back uh, eight years ago called Loche Life. It was an exhibition based on a book that was written by Richard Price called, uh, based on real facts that, that happened in the Lower East Side. So for me getting involved in that co-curation with Franklin Evans, who was my co-curator and who's also an artist, um, was very interesting because it was the early days of uh, the galleries making the transition from Chelsea to the Lower East Side and we got to 
do something that at the time uh, was important, was to reinforce the, the sense of community when it comes to galleries that now exist in this part of town. Um, each chapter of the book was a different show. And it was nine chapters, and we did nine shows, uh, nine group shows. So you could only imagine the amount of work that, uh, that it entitles uh, to talk to nine galleries, convince nine galleries to open at the same time, have the same opening, and be part of the same exhibition. So, um, so it, was, it was a process, and everything sort of connects. Uh, that led me to the Nicaraguan Biennial, and Williamson is here, one of uh, the artists that participated in the Biennial. Uh, when they invited me to come to Nicaragua, I was not necessarily sure what to expect. Uh, so my first two trips were research-based trips, was basically getting to know the countries, histories, people. I believe that a biennial has to really touch the people. It has to really have some kind of impact with the local communities. Otherwise, um, it's not really a biennial, uh, in the sense of what we think of biennials. Uh, not necessarily the Whitney Biennial, which happens every two years, but there's this other um, thing called biennials that span throughout the cities and that um, it's more about research and being there and understanding uh, the public in general, not just the art public. So with that, with the, in, Nicaraguan Biennial, I went and I researched and I realized that the history of Nicaragua is extremely charged. Extremely charged politically, extremely charged uh, when it comes to natural disasters, to earthquakes in a period of uh, 40 years. One was in 1933 and the other one 1974 or 73, around that time, 1932. 73, am I right, Williamson, around that time? So you're talking about a, a, a place that is full of, um, of a lot of things, of suffering, of uh, rebirth, a place that people refer to one address, not by the name of the street, just by something that was there before. So there is something called collective memory. And we realize that they exist based on collective memory because what was there before is not on any longer there. Um, I, I remember I was with you, Williamson, one time, and we were trying to get to an address in Managua, and uh, the person told us, you go two blocks that way, you'll see the greenhouse, just to put it as an example, I don't know the specifics of it, but you see the greenhouse, and, and then you make a right, and the next block, uh, you will see a monument, uh, and they mentioned the monument, then you make the left. We got two blocks, there was no greenhouse, but it was, there was a greenhouse there 30 years earlier, or maybe 40 years earlier, but it wasn't there anymore. And then you uh, make a left, and the monument was not any longer there. So that's what Nicaragua is. It's this sort of sense of memory, but it's also a sense of rebuilding and reinventing their own time as they go along based on memories. Uh, so the, the, the biennial pretty much dealt with this sense of loss, but a sense of, uh, of, of, of also possessing something and owning something. And uh, that led me to uh, bring 18 artists that came from abroad to participate in the biennial. There were four American, young American artists to actually uh, one of them, a uh, former graduate from this program, Leah Dixon, who many of you might know, and Williamson, who actually went to Yale, and another artist uh, that went to uh, Columbia. So I wanted to sort of kind of work with recent graduates from different art schools and to put them in contact and make connections to young artists in Nicaragua because Doing a biennial is also about creating bridges. It's about connecting people. And that's something that we need to be very much aware of. Uh, so even before they came, I made 
meet their partner. I created a partner there, and I was like, they might not get along. I mean, it's a risk you take, but they, they might get along, or they might not, but they will come up with something, absolutely. And to our advantage, and we were very lucky, it was a great relationship that flourished, and among all of them. And now they go to Nicaragua and they do exhibitions there since they've been there two, three times, and they're going very, very soon for another exhibition. So when you do a biennial, you want to see this as well. I also place artists in uh, communities that are extremely poor, like El Pantanal. It's a community of people living in very precarious ways that they don't have any kind of infrastructure, they don't have anything. They basically, the women are alone with the children. The men leave. They father the kids and then they disappear. So you have a lot of single mothers raising kids, uh, surviving on reselling or selling uh, discarded materials. Uh, and with that, I felt that I needed to um, to work within that community somehow. So we placed two artists, one that was building homes for them, and another artist from Mexico, Joaquin Segura. So he worked on rescuing a monument that was lost, a monument from the time of the war that was lost because they had taken the metal, and the only thing that remained was the pedestal because it was concrete. So they took the metal of this monument to sell it in order to survive. So it was gone. So what he did, he built around the pedestal a new monument and a, a space for the community. The community didn't have a park. They didn't have a place to meet. There was not a center point. So by working within the community and having a whole um, set of questions to the community to ask them what they really wanted in place of the monument that was there, so based on that questionnaire, they arrived at one particular uh, project that sort of kind of represented who the, this community. And now it is a place for meeting. It is a, play, a place, uh, you know, there, were, the, there was a garden that was uh, planted. There were the, the, the monument was uh, reinstalled. They wanted a... Nicaraguan flag and another flag from the party that they endorse and so forth. So uh, I'm just giving you this little bit of my history because I might come across as just a fair guy. And the fair is just another channel for me to be able to support artists. And I believe in that. That's what I've been doing for many years now because that's, that's my passion. That's what I believe and I think it's extremely important. Uh, with the fair, it's interesting because I do incorporate a lot of not-for-profits into the conversation. I work with um, artists run spaces and commercial galleries, and in some cases, museums. So I'm gonna give you a sense of what I do when it comes to the art fair. Uh, let me see, okay. Untitled happens in two places, and many of you probably know. We do it in Miami, and we build a tent on the sand, just as you see it, right on the water, and it is an international art fair. So we work with galleries from many different countries, and that makes me uh, sort of a little bit um, Excited, no, not a little bit. It makes me very excited that I can travel and not only be part of the New York kind of um, community, art community, but also to come into different art communities in different places and get to understand it as well and see what, how people work outside here, outside New York. So, um, so the tent is built by architects. We do have something that is quite unique because the tent is translucent. The, 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 um, you can see during the daytime, uh, the whole tent is, or the inside of the tent, is illuminated with natural light. So for me, seeing artwork 
uh, lighted with natural light is incredible. It's, it's such an experience because you, you feel it differently. It floats in the space. It's, it's a different feeling altogether. Um, that's one of the things that I like about this location is, is the light. It's very, very bright. Um, um, and then we do it in San Francisco. The first year we did it in an abandoned uh, warehouse um, th that was in the Dog Patch neighborhood. I don't know, it's a new neighborhood. It's kind of the equivalent to Bushwick here where it's kind of shifting and changing and now they have the Minnesota Art Project and it's, it's less of an artist community. San Francisco is tricky that way because it's, it's too expensive, the rents but it's become um, more, um, um, more galleries, more artist run spaces, and it's quite a dynamic uh, neighborhood. Uh, we had to move for the second edition, which is, this is the place where we do it now. It's the Palace of Fine Arts. And talking about art fairs and seeing the Palace of Fine Arts, um, I have a little story here that you will love. Um, art fairs, the way we see them now, most people think that they start, it, it started with Art Cologne or Art Basel, which are the oldest uh, sample of contemporary or modern art fairs. But in reality, to me, art fairs go back to the mid-19th century, 1848, the Green Park exhibition that happened in London the salon shows in Paris, all of that were earlier forms of art fairs. It was a way of exposing, you know, the Armory Show, the 1917 Armory Show. It was a way of exposing new trends in what was happening with art at the time. And that's what we do now with art fairs. Maybe the structure is changed. Maybe they, they didn't have these sort of cubicles, but I see a shift now. I think that the old model of um, what we see now with the booth, you know, the sort of kind of galleries booth is shifting little by little. Like, for example, Independent, an art fair that happens here in New York and Brussels, they've been very good at sort of distributing the layout in such a way that it feels more like a show rather than a each gallery with a particular space. We see that happening just recently, and some of you were in Mexico uh, now, uh, with Material Art Fair. Material Art Fair, it could never happen in the US because of uh, all the regulations and permits that we have to go through, which is a nightmare, I do that. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't do that for Ontario, but I know that everything has to have a permit. Even where you place something, uh, you have to leave open spaces in case of fire and all of that. In Mexico, it's different. In Mexico, it's people do whatever they want and nobody cares. But, you know, that allows for much more creativity. And you see it in the architecture, you see it in the city. The city is such a mismatch of different materials and architectural styles and personal taste because they don't have to go through all these permits and regulations that we have here in the States. Um, but what was interesting about material is that the whole fair happens on a scaffolding that is around this space. So you go up a scaffolding all the way up and you see all these galleries around it. It was quite beautiful, quite incredible. Um, very interesting uh, structurally and it's a different way of, of seeing art. Um, anyway, we can do that here, but we try our best to, to work with what we have. I think with Untitled, we always involve architects to design the floor plan. We're still a little bit on the traditional and conservative side when it comes to the layout, simply because uh, galleries still want to have their own space and they want to make sure that, um, that people see them and don't get confused or don't confuse them with other spaces. But little by little we're making changes and this year we're going to make some changes to Untitled and I think they will be very good. Um, um, okay, so I'm going to continue with 
uh, the presentation, just to give you some examples. Um, one of the things we do with Untitled, and when I met, when I talked about the the see-through thing with a uh, light, is what you see. It's a fabric on the roof that absorbs light. It's natural light. Um, it's beautiful, beautiful during the daytime. Um, we um, we have very wide um, aisles because we want to be able to. Uh, allow the public to enjoy the process of looking at art. I hate art fairs, and that's why people basically say, oh, we hate art fairs, because sometimes you cannot look at the art. Sometimes it's overhang, sometimes, and I try my best to work with each of the galleries so they don't over, overhang, unless it's intentional. It's the concept behind the booth. But, um, but also, you need to be able to step back and look at the art. You need to be able to, to look at it and enjoy it. it. It should be an enjoyable process. And by opening up the aisles, by having spaces in between that are wide and open, it allows time for the mind to sort of kind of uh, absorb and rest and absorb again. And, and it becomes a great sort of enjoyable moment. Uh, art should be looked at that way. Um, what we do uh, as well that my colleague Amanda Schmidt uh, is the director of programming and uh, she's uh, done a magnificent show what uh, was called Untitled Radio in collaboration. The structure was built by um, a side lab which is a not-for-profit in Grand Rapids. Um, they are great, they do a lot of public um, interventions, uh, and they build the structure that you see there. And we're looking at images not from December last year. I show you some from December last year, but these are images from 2016, and it's changed a little bit that uh, structure. But one, one of the things with this is that we call it on, uh, Untitled Radio and we collaborate with a, radio, a local radio station called Wynwood Radio and we build an archive that you can go back and for educational purposes. An archive of all the conversations that happened during that week. So it's a tool for education. It's something you can go to our website and listen, you know, from musicians to art historians to philosophers to artists to curators, museum directors. It's a very, uh, very diverse uh, um, conversation program um, that is curated by Amanda, Sh Amanda Schmidt. Um, we're going to change the name because radio doesn't, you know, it's getting a little to, uh, we, we want it with a new restructuring, we're going to come up with a new name for this project. So we'll uh, announce it soon, just because we need to keep moving and, and pushing uh, to make it stronger. And having a new name could lead to new opportunities and possibilities and more, um, more things to open up. Uh, but we will continue with this because it's been quite uh, successful and it's also interactive. And it sits right in the heart of the fair. So everybody goes there and it's a point of meeting and a point of uh, talking to people and meeting people. And, um, and it's a social space. I mean, all of this is, at the end of the day, a social space that facilitates uh, conversations. Um, um, here we have, uh, we do a special projects. And I mentioned to you that in this particular year, we did this piece that is a collaboration between Thomas Bu and Rick Trick Tirabanisha. Um, some of you might know both of these artists, uh, one of them is a pre-maker and he's from um, Vietnam and he remembers as a little kid carrying the surfing boards for the Americans in Vietnam. We're talking about in the 70s. 
And uh, that's something that he's kept with him as part of his uh, personal history and memory. And he's brought this back this idea of uh, symbols and music that he collaborates with Rigtrick. Rigtrick comes up with his song. Rigtrick is from Thailand. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Rigtrick's work, but it's work that is performative, is uh, culturally charged. So this collaboration between the two of them is fantastic because people could actually go and interact and take one surfing board and try to surf because we're right on the beach. But there is a whole, there is a lot of content to this work, but it's also visually uh, stunning and visually beautiful. There's a lot of details. All these boards are engraved and they're quite, quite beautiful. Uh, so that was one of the special projects that we presented in 2016. We also presented uh, this, which is very different and more into the Fluxus movement for many reasons, because I've always been fascinated by work that is ephemeral and is also very much interested about ideas. And, and I do actually see the beauty on water on the floor as it dries, or I see the beauty on work that it deteriorates itself until it disappears. I think that there's something really special about that. And, and I think Mark mentioned that I curated a show that um, right before Untitled, 33 artists, and it was all based on fluxes and ephemeral works and performative work and all of that, which is something that I always been very much interested and thanks God I ended up going to San Francisco. I'm going to show you some examples. There's a long history of that in San Francisco. And we got the privilege to collaborate with 500 Capstree, which is the foundation that preserves the work of David Ireland, which is an artist that I really, really like what he does. Um, I mean, what he did, he's dead. Um, anyway, but this is interesting. What you see right here is the work of Naomi Escandel, an artist that was active in the 70s and 80s in Buenos Aires, in Argentina. As many of you know, there is a history of the dictatorship there that is quite a really dark time in their history. And uh, Naomi, Naomi piece was done in 83, and this is the first time that it's done again, and it's interactive. So basically, uh, you have to write the news of the day that you would like to hear, not what was happening that day, but what you would like to hear. As a, so people will come and write whatever they wanted to hear, rather than what was in the news. And then we posted all these uh, this questions and answers on a big board so people could go and see what people's uh, desires of what they want to hear in the news are, which is quite beautiful, uh, I think. Um, very simple, but very, very beautiful. This is Rick Trick actually doing his, uh, working on his piece. Uh, he had another work at Untitled on the, on the, I'm um, sorry, on the, the deck. And as you see, he's putting the message on the water tank. So the water tank was basically where people would take, come and take a shower after they've been surfing on, on the surfboards that we looked at. That was a collaboration between Rick Trick and uh, Thomas. Um, another view of the radio, Winwood Radio, Untitled Radio. One thing that we do with One Star Press, which is, uh, they, they actually work with me as curators for three years, I don't title four years, and they uh, still continue collaborating with us by doing these particular projects. Um, and these are uh, limited edition posters where they commission a number of artists to do a poster. It's a very a limited edition that is uh, given for free throughout the time of the fair. So people can take them with them. It's participatory, but it's also great that art can be accessible to just anyone. 
Uh, okay, this is this year. So now we move from 2016 to 2017, last year, 17. Uh, this is the work of Carlos Cruz Diez. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work, but he is a master of op art in Latin America and Europe, uh, very much active in the 60s and late 50s through his still making art. He's uh, 92, 93 years old. And uh, we brought the whole exhibition that was at the SCAP Museum of Art to Untitled. So this is an outdoor piece, it's a special project that we did in collaboration with the SCAD, SCAD Art Museum. And um, when you walk inside the container, you walk through light. It's quite beautiful. It's three different rooms inside the container and you experience this sort of sense of entering a painting. It's, it's, it's very, it, the piece is from 1967, if I'm not mistaken. In, from the 60s, so it's really ahead, you know, this piece is incredible and it's still very impactful uh, when you walk into the space. I mean, it's, you, you go through different tones of light. Uh, I, I don't even know how to describe it. You have, it's one of those things you have to uh, experience. Uh, we also did a solo exhibition of his work. Um, I had this idea that I wanted to feature Every year, an older artist in on, at Untitled, a much older artist that has been a, an influence to younger generations. So you can make a connection between the younger artists, the, the new mm, current um, movements, or whatever is happening now, to what was the, from there before. Um, I think that's important. Those. It's, it's a way of understanding a lot of things uh, uh, about contemporary art. So these are just uh, pictures of the show. Uh, we also collaborated with, um, and this is, I'm telling you this is just so you know that art fairs also uh, expand the conversation in too many, direct, in many di directions, be um, with the Scott Art Museum, and an older artist, but also with a foundation. We collaborated with the Gordon Mark Mata Clark Foundation here in New York, where uh, actually that's his widow who's sitting on the chair there. And, um, and this, of course, was supported by David Swinner Gallery, uh, but who repre they represent the state of Gordon Mata Clark. I hope that many of you got to see the show at the Bronx Museum. And how many of you got to see it? It was an amazing show, amazing. Um, very important artist, um, very, very influential. Um, this piece is called The Garbage Wall. And this piece was done under his instructions in Miami with local garbage. All this was rescued from the Biscayne Bay, Bay area. So this was also in the sea. And I was very lucky to know somebody that is working with his students on this environmentalist um, project where they're cleaning the Biscayne Bay. So he ended up collaborating with a foundation and made the connection. My friend John Bailey, who I went to graduate school with, and he ended up working with his students and the foundation to rescue garbage from the bay area and build this under the instructions of Gordon Mata Clark. The films that you see in the background are actually uh, films uh, from the 60s um, and maybe early 70s, early films. Um, um, yeah, um, it's quite beautiful to see that. And this is as they are cleaning around the garbage wall. The, the things that they found was very in, intriguing. I mean, it also talks about the place. Um, there were things that came from Cuba. And as you know, many people take boats or rats to, cut, to make it from Cuba to, um, to Florida, to the Florida coast, to South Florida. 
So they, you, you found stuff that was very much about these people's histories and, and you don't know if they really made it or they died trying to make it to, to the US. Um, it's quite, quite moving when you look at it, when you start paying attention to details in, the, in this particular work. Um, we also had the tents by Lucy and Jorge Horta. I'm not sure if you guys know the work. He's Argentinian and she's British, but they've been collaborating for 30 years. They're also married. And these tents were in the Antart Antarctica. So it's part of a whole concept behind it that also talks about shelter and talks about um, the environment. So as you see, things start connecting. When you curate and you do this special project, you, you, you really start thinking about how all the things connect and why they connect. Um, and that's how you curate, basically. This is another piece, as you can see, another shelter. <laughs> Uh, and I have to say, the garbage wall by Gordon Mata Clark was conceived for the first time in 1972 under the Brooklyn Bridge. And it was his approach to homelessness. He was trying to create a new architecture, a new form of architecture uh, to, um, to, um, to, for, for the homeless in situation through discarded materials and how he could build through things that you find everywhere, some kind of architecture to give, uh, you know, to make, to build homes for, for the homeless population in New York in the early 70s. So it is connected to, to that conceptually. Uh, this is the, the work of, um, um, sorry, my mind is, Sergio Vega, Sergio Vega, an artist that I would like you to, to, uh, to pay attention to, because I remember when I first moved to New York, and the thing is, everything is, a, is in a circle, you know, could be 10 years from now, five, six, whatever, or, but I, I remember him from showing with a gallery called Basilico, Basilico Fine Arts, uh, it's an amazing gallery in the 90s in New York, showing great, great artists, and, I saw a show by, uh, uh, of his and I was like, oh my God, this, this artist is so great. He went to Yale, uh, not because he went to Yale. I mean, I'm not trying to favor that, but it's just, it just I remember, like, I, we didn't, we, we weren't there at the same time. But, but, but for me, it was important to see what was coming out of certain art schools at the time. There was less, people were doing less painting. Um, there was uh, in the 90s. There was a lot of uh, installations, uh, conceptually based work, and and less painting. Painting people were fed up with painting from the 80s. There were too many painters in the 80s. So anyway, so as you know, the 80s was heavy on painting and uh, the market and all of that. And then the 1989 crash happened, and uh, people started. You know, people like Felix Gonzalez Torres. He started showing right after that in a uh, show with Andrea Rosen Gallery. I uh, still believe the foundation is represented uh, by her. By her. Um, so that kind of work, this kind of uh, ephemeral, more participatory, more about ideas and so forth. So this was an incredible work, I have to say. He built it, everybody was complaining. That's the other thing, the tension that you create in art fairs because the booth, you have to negotiate a lot because you have galleries that are trying to sell art and then you put a special project right across from them. They think that that's gonna take away attention from them and that that's gonna take business away. And I'm like, no, if I think people will notice what you have and everything connects and people will come around and people will come see this and then go to your booth. Anyway, it's a whole like negotiation kind of dynamic that you have to be sometimes diplomatic and sometimes you just lose it, you know? I, it's the way it is, you know? It's, it's you know, we're all human. Uh, but anyways, it was incredible. You walk in there, there was like a lot of references, uh, references to Brazilian art. Um, 
something you guys should look into, Brazilian art, uh, 70s, Otichica, um, all of that is it, there. Um, there was music going on inside, there were videos, it was just really a great, great piece. Um, and it was all garbage found in Miami. So again, the same way that uh, uh, things that for the Gold Mata Clark wall that were found in the Biscayne Bay area, this is all rescue from Miami garbage. So it's all re reusable or recycled materials. Okay, so this is the first Untitled San Francisco. We're not there anymore. I show you, I believe, the image of where we are now. So this was pretty funky, as you can see. But people love it, but it was very difficult to get to, and it was too alternative. And I think where we are now is much more accessible, and I love the building and its history, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that building in a bit, this building. This is the Palace of Fine Arts. And in 1915, uh, there was a warfare in, um, in San Francisco, and this was built. I mean, this is incredible. Have many of you, or have you ever been there? Mark? Yeah, it's, it's incredible. It's an incredible building. It's, it's overwhelming, actually, when the dimensions, when there was so much money to put into these, uh, these things. And, uh, I, I, I believe this was probably built by Italy. I don't know why. Maybe I'm wrong, but it just has that feeling. That I don't know. But what I do know is that one of the things that I did this year, I visited Estabangor, and my friend Ian, who is a curator, I just saw him come in, uh, also curated a show in the same space that I curated a show earlier this year in Estabangor. Uh, Stavanger is in the north of Norway and is incredible as a city. Uh, there are a lot of art spaces there. And I came up with the idea of bringing all these uh, not for profits to San Francisco from Stavanger. It was a crazy idea because I was like, okay, what's the connection? Norway, San Francisco. They both happen to be about the same size cities. They both have a lot of not-for-profit institutions. Of course, San Francisco has a SF MoMA. They don't have an SF MoMA, but they have a smaller versions of that. Um, but they're also extremely rich cities. San Francisco is the tech industry. Estabanger is oil. So there is a lot of wealth in both cities. So I was like, and they both by the water, and they both have the same type of temperature. So I was like, there are too many coincidences. Why not invite three not-for-profits from Estabanger and partner them the same way that I partnered William Sam with Anaris Alejandro from Nicaragua to partner, let's say, the Estabanger uh, Kunsthal with C.C. Waters in San Francisco and create a connection between them to see if in the future they will possibly collaborate on a project and something can happen. I believe that things don't just stop there. Things keep going. And, and, um, and I think that just creating that kind of uh, space and letting them be as time goes. Uh, so um, what was interesting about this was that I had no idea that in 1915 there was an exhibition in this building where we were doing Untitled. So Untitled is the first art show that happens in the building after the 1915 exhibition. But what's really interesting is, coincidence, that the artists, they used to give medals to artists as a recognition of which one was the best piece. So the artists who won the gold medal in this 1915 exhibition was an artist from Norway, Estabanger. An artist from Estabanger that nobody knows now. That is, no, nothing is known about him. He won the medal and there was a famous artist that we all know about now, another Norwegian artist, can think of the name, that didn't win. But the one that won is, is gone. But the person who is rescuing his work 
who is an art historian, who also came to San Francisco simply because she was connected to these not-for-profit spaces. When she got there and she started to research the Palace of Fine Arts, she found this history that this man, who she's trying to bring back, this artist from the late 19th century, early 20th century, was the one that won the, prize, the gold medal in this uh, particular place. So now she wrote a whole um, article in Norwegian for the paper there, where I, I, I couldn't read it because it was in Norwegian. But anyway, it was a long article and she sent me a link to it, but it's like, what? I, the only thing that I recognized was my name on it, but <laughs> simply because she, she asked me a few questions for the article. Um, but anyway, uh, this, this kind, kind of things happen, and it's, it's just so interesting when, when it happens, and, and it sort of keeps you going because sometimes is you know, what we do could be very tough and hard, but we keep going. Uh, and then there's a good moments that, that um, so as you see, San Francisco has a whole different feel to untitled Miami. It's a little, it's an industrial building. Um, in this case, it's not industrial, it's a pavilion, but it's dark, it's San Francisco. We have to use uh, artificial light. Um, it's just a different thing. In San Francisco, we do collaborate with at least 15 local not-for-profits, C.C. Waters, Berkeley Art Museum, the Chinese Cultural Center, um, the, the Fabric Workshop, 500 Cap Street, I can keep going. We do incorporate the local community not, that is not, you know, commercial galleries. And we're very proud of that because that really makes us understand that community a little bit better because we're coming into their community and, uh, and we need to somehow be able to, to understand where we are. So, so this is from the first, I'm sorry, this particular image is from 2006, 17, January 2017. We just did January 2018 in a different uh, building. This is um, something we did with CC Waters, um, and it was basically a bar that they built at Untitled, but it also was a place for the radio. So all the conversations happened at the bar, and people could actually have a drink, sit around, be part of the conversation. It was fantastic. That was CC Waters' project, the Waters Bar and radio. So these are some images. You know, when people have a dream, people relax. So it's always good. Yeah. Um, this is actually uh, 500 Cap Street, which is David Ireland's house. Um, it is now a foundation, and you can go visit it. I suggest that if you are in San Francisco, make sure to stop by, make an appointment, it's incredible. Um, the wall is an artwork he painted many, 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 many times over it to create this particular finish. So it is a work, he, he was very performative. So it is a work by Dever Ireland. The whole house is a work by Dever Ireland. Um, that's him performing. Uh, this is their booth. Uh, the fair that year, the 500 Cap Street Foundation. Uh, this is a piece from the fabric workshop, very different to what I do, but I also believe in this kind of craft that should have a space as well, because they work with a lot of um, disadvantage or people within their community that they do a lot um, for the community. And this is them, their booth. Um, we also collaborated with the lab and we did a, a fundraiser through Untitled where people could actually buy tickets and go on a boat. Um, and there was something that happened many, many years ago and they redid it. 
and it was very successful, sold out, they raised some money, and that's great when you can facilitate that kind of uh, a space for a small organization to raise funds as well. Um, San Francisco, that's the boat and where they did their fundraiser. I didn't go, so I can't talk too much about it, but I heard it was a lot of fun. And this is the DJ in the boat. This is, um, and then we go to like a big name artist, uh, Ugo Rondinoni. So we presented two pieces by Ugo Rondinoni that were sold to raise money to the Berkeley Art Museum. And uh, they did sell them and they raised some money. So their booth was just two Ugo Rondinoni paintings, uh, as you can see here. So I believe in this sort of kind of between emerging and also established, because I think one fits the other, and that's important. Uh, this is a young artist. Ian, do you remember the name of this artist? It's Norwegian. Uh, it's a woman artist. Okay, uh, I can say that again. <laughs> anyway, but, but she, these this were very monumental. These were um, works on paper. They look like a skin because she, she layers and layers and layers, uh, layers and layers of paper and uh, was holding it is, 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 um, is um, some form of leather that resembles also skin. And it's really hard to tell here, but when you see it in person, they're quite amazing and beautiful. The surface, the, the, the size of it. This is our new venue in San Francisco, the, the uh, Palace of Fine Arts. Um, that's that's the, the new one, the, the entrance. This is the new venue. Um, this is what, what we did um, with an awful profits that came from Estaban Group. We designed a booth that the middle wall was a little shorter, so on one side, we will have, for example, on the right-hand side is the Kungshall in Estabanger. And on the left-hand side is CC Waters in San Francisco. So throughout the, the, the days of the art fair, they're interacting with each other and they're getting to know each other because they're not necessarily sharing a booth, but they're neighbors and they can see each other because one wall is shorter than the two outside walls. So it's, it's a nice form of collaboration. It's a nice form of getting to know each other and possibly this could lead to a future project that they can collaborate. This is a performance by their, David Ireland that was happening. It's basically they read the, the pages of a phone book and, and then they tear them and they throw them on the floor. All the names is performed, it's a performance. Uh, so it's, it's with the phone book, the local phone book. As they finish reading all the names of that page, the page gets turned out and then thrown on the floor. Um, we also had some big name galleries like David Swinner, who did a solo booth of Oscar Murillo which is a Colombian artist, a young Colombian artist. And it was actually quite beautiful. Oscar was there installing the work. Um, he really paid a lot of attention to details of how the work was going to be shown. And, and, and there were incredible works um, in the booth that um, I was very, I got to know Oscar, which was very nice. And uh, we, we talked quite a bit. And, um, and now I saw him in Guadalajara. He was in Guadalajara briefly. So you also established, this is a very large work by Oscar Murillo. I'm not sure if you guys know his work, but he's shown quite a bit here in uh, New York. He was in a show at MoMA recently that was all about painting, about a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, but what I did, I placed that right next to a very small gallery from Spain, from um, near Valencia. 
uh, and she showed the work of a pioneer woman artist from Brazil, Annabella Geiger. I'm not sure if you know her work, but you should definitely know it because she is an earlier uh, a woman artist from that region working with video art and performance, Annabella Geiger. And um, most of the works in the booth were documentation of photographs or vintage works by the artist. Um, she has a strong connection to some of the Fluxus artists. Um, I also, uh, what you see out here is not, I'm talking about the, where the Begonia, which is the gallery she's sitting, is where her work is. It's mostly photographic work. And this is some examples of her work. Uh, she's been making work since the late 50s, early 60s, and she's 84 years old and is still making work, uh, mostly performance. Annabella Geiger. Um, and that is to look into. She was in the show Radical Woman from Latin America at the Hammer for Pacific Standard show in, in LA. Um, so um, she's definitely in the radar of a lot of institutions and like curators. She's in many museum shows. Um, very interesting artist. Um, many museums collections, I meant, no shows. She does have shows at museums as well. Uh, she's also represented by Mendes Wood, which is a gallery in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And then also with, um, with a gallery um, in uh, Spain. Thank you for the talk, Omar. It's kind of mystifying how art fairs come together. They're so complicated. <laughs> it was really interesting to see hear the behind the scenes. Um, I was thinking about, um, you know, we're preparing for the thesis show that we do with the graduates every year. And you were talking about the sort of negotiations and the best way to see a lot of art in one place. And, um, you know, so we're, we're all working on this project together, all the second year students thinking about how to show, best show their work. So do you have any advice for them about how to think about exhibition making and, um, you know, in the context of a group show rather than what they're used to, which is, you know, individually kind of like in the studios, everyone has their own space. I think uh, you need to be aware of the other people's work and who you're showing right next to because that, that is part of the conversation. And from my experience, I can tell you, uh, three years ago, I curated the show for Columbia MFA. And I tried to do something that was pretty much uh, hard to do because, uh, because precisely negotiating. And, and um, they were used to having their own little space so they could all show their work in this, you know, like an art fair in compartments. Um, and I tried to break it up and mix them together. And they succeeded in some cases, and in other cases, it was almost like, you know, people would come to me crying and <laughs> things like that. <laughs> because people want to, you know, have their own work speak on, on its own space, because after, you know, being involved in the program. But, uh, but I, I suggest that it's really important that whoever is curating the show it's not just picking work from each of you and saying this is what I want in the show. It's like, how is it relating to the person right next to you and the person across? Because there's gotta be a conversation there. Because I believe in the strength of the group, you know, in the individual strength. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's really important. It's, it's, it's really important that you are in conversation with, with something that complements what you do um, and um, in the sense of, could be conceptually, visually, or both, uh, I don't know. Um, I was just wondering about your own personal aesthetic and also like the mission of, of most of the curating that you do in terms of, I guess, especially the fairs. Um, like what you bring with you, what you leave behind, 
Um, and if there is a particular like focus and like not only about um, help with the community or maybe showing emerging work, but if there's an overall aesthetic that you aspire to? I do. I, I have a very specific uh, aesthetic. Whether I'm right or wrong, I know what I like, and I have to follow that. <laughs> but uh, with art fairs, I have to be more flexible. Uh, I have to be more inclusive. Uh, when I do shows, I, I'm, I'm, I can cho choose whatever I want. I mean, I, I work with what I want to work. With art fairs, I need to understand that there are different approaches to making art. And I need to be inclusive because if you have a whole art fair with just one vision, it becomes boring because people don't go to an art fair to just see this. Let's say it's not what I like, but let's say if it's abstraction or whatever. Uh, they don't go to an art fair to see the same thing repeating over and over. They go there to, for a different reason. And also it's a larger platform. It's a much, much larger platform with a lot of different voices. For example, a lot of the work that is coming out of Africa, continental Africa, is work that tends to be he heavily in figuration, heavy in figuration, because of the tradition. It's not necessarily my focus, but I need to respect that and accept that and include it, incorporate it, because it is a voice. It is a voice. It's a different form of, you know, it's, there's a whole tradition there. So I have to, but if I'm curating a show, maybe that's not what my focus is. Maybe my focus is on something else. But, uh, but if I'm going to work in an international art fair and I want to have a gallery that is from, uh, I don't know, Congo or somewhere else, I need to respect that particular you know, I need to take that into consideration. Yeah. Does that answer your question? It's just, it's, it's different, you know, it's a different kind of. For example, I love Brazil. I love everything <laughs> that happens there with materials. I think. Brazilians have this sort of kind of touch and sensibility about materials. Like there is an artist called uh, Paolo Nazare, John Ares, and there is another artist called Andres Kumatsu. They're close, they're same generation. The way they just take things that are from everyday life, you know, like materials or be concrete, or, and they put them together, it's just really, there's something, it's very poetic, it's very, there is something about it that only, I think the Brazilians are the masters in doing that somehow. You mentioned, uh, I think it, it was um, Brazilian like artists, like Brazilian art from the 1970s. So like I'm thinking like, oh, what's his name? Like Mireles who did, is that? the Seldo Mireles? Yeah, who did the, um, he, he, it was on like the, the Coke and the, he print on the, um, on the uh, on the dollar bill and like so it's like conversations about it's like highly political but it's like conversation it's like dialogues around like circulation and you know ideologies with language so I was wondering I don't know if they're like related but have you had to have you had artists like that where it's you know it might not be such an easy kind of transition to the context of an art fair when you have something that's so like, for instance, that being about a different kind of circulation and a different kind of exposure. Uh, what's your question? I'm sorry. I'm I, if you've had, like, the... the sorry. Like, have the uh, art that, like that, have you dealt with art that, in that kind of art fair You context? mean with younger artists? No, I mean, like, because you mentioned the... the um, Brazilian 1970s artists, so I was thinking like... Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just wondering like how that kind of, that kind of thing happens in an art fair, you know, that's... Well, I, I, I think because of Brazil, I mean, the country uh, itself is, is sort of, um, you know, when you think of Orichica and you think about the whole tradition of... Um, um, it, it, it has a lot to do with Brazil 
I mean, in, in the 50s, they built Brasilia. Brasilia was like the future. So there was this sense of um, the future in chaos, because Brazil has always been in chaos. Um, I don't know how to explain it. It's this sort of kind of um, duality that exists there, that you see it through the art. Um, I mean, when I think about artists from Mexico, like Gabriel Orozco, and now I recently mentioned another Gabriel, Gabriel um, who just had a show at, at um, Perrotan, Rico, Gabriel Rico, which is younger, much younger. And the way they work with materials and they build these incredibly beautiful poetic things. But still there is something that is less political than the Brazilian artists. The Brazilian artists do all of this, but always with a very strong political undertone. It's very different. They're both good, but their use of materials and the, me the, the message behind tends to be very different. Um, why is that? I think Brazil has been less stable than Mexico. Mexico has been pretty stable in some ways after the revolution, but Brazil has had very unstable kind of political. Uh, I don't know if that has something to do with that. More corruption. Mexico is pretty corrupt too, but it's just a different, uh, it's a different history. Uh, Mexico has a strong visual, visually charged history. Um, I think Brazil is more about necessity in some ways. They also have a history of um, slavery, which was abolished not too long ago. And maybe, I don't know, I, I, that's something to think about, but um, yeah. I don't know if this answers your question. No, I, I, I like the answer. Thank you. You do? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I can just get, go all, all off on this. Um, you talked a lot about the work you do with nonprofit galleries and organizations, um, and it seems that one thing you're trying to do is leverage the resources of an art fair to support these nonprofit activities and other kinds of projects. Obviously, the market and the not-for-profit art world exists in a kind of symbiotic relationship that's sometimes antagonistic but often mutually supporting. You haven't talked very much about the market, however, and I'm wondering, since you've been the artistic director and curator of one of the best art fairs, I think, uh, of, you know, for six years now. Yes, um, uh, well, I just started well, just, seven just, years ago, but okay, so if I we did our sixth just, edition, yeah. Um, what, do you, what changes have you seen in that time in the market? And the market or, or, has shifted. Or trends? And uh, um, yeah, what do you see happening these days in terms of uh, the, 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 the role of the fair in the market? You know, how is Untitled's position changing? And you know, just if you could opine a little bit on, on the market side of what you do. Yeah, I mean, this is something that we, thanks Mark for bringing that up because this is something we've been discussing a lot internally and, and also with other people. Uh, the market has shifted. Um, it seems like the blue chip and the higher prices uh, are easier to place now than, um, and that's been a big problem with the mid-tier mid, mid level galleries that are suffering a great deal. It's hard for them. And also the big, bigger galleries, the, the, the ones that are absorbing all the business and also taking their artists af after. So it's shifting. Um, the emerging market is a little soft now to Maybe it's a good thing because there was a moment, and, and you remember like seven, eight years ago, that an artist can, could go uh, from selling a painting in $10,000 to within a year to $300,000, $200,000. There was like this sort of kind of play with the market, with emerging artists. A few years ago, that was very clear. I mean, I remember, I, I have to say, and this stays here, but 
I don't know, maybe, maybe I shouldn't say it because we've been... Yeah, but I'm not going to mention names, but some collectors that were buying a lot of work by one artist and for not a lot of money and then all of a sudden doing a show and increasing the value of the work from one year to the next. Um, <laughs> they were making careers uh, and no, no careers, a market for the work. Um, still happening, but I think to a lesser degree, and it's harder now for emerging artists to sell work or sell it for, you know, for higher prices. I think it's, it's tricky right now. Uh, I don't know if, it, I, so I'm trying to understand it, right, so but there has been a shift. So Untitled is one of the fairs that exists itself in a symbiotic relationship with other fairs. Right? Like so yeah. in Miami, there's Art Basel Miami Beach, which tends to attract most of the blue chip galleries. That's blue chip, yeah. And so does it put fairs like Untitled in a precarious position? We, uh, we little by little will be, it, we're not just emerging, we're also presenting, for example, Emmy Shepard, who just painted the portrait of uh, uh, the first, former first lady. Uh, we presented her work at Untitled this December. Um, I can mention many artists that did well at Untitled and now, but, um, but I think they're also coming with galleries that have been around for a while, that have connections, that they might not necessarily be in our Basel, but they, are, they have some kind of history and they have collectors and institutions and people that support their project. Then the emerging galleries is, is a bit more complicated because we do have galleries that have been around for 20 years, 10, 15 years, and then we have galleries that have been around for five. And those are the ones that is, is, is hard. I mean, they make, they're doing it, but is, it, it is, it's not as easy or as it was a few years back. Um, we did okay this year, I mean this past year. We did better than the year before on Title Miami. Um, considering all the other fairs that we have around, it was quite successful and we, we did get a lot of collectors, institutions, museums buying, uh, public collections. So we've been very lucky. It's still functioning. <laughs> you talk about your interest in, or you mentioned a couple of examples of ephemeral work. Um, my question is, how is your perspective about that kind of work in relation to a, fa a space like a fair or in, in a commercial uh, setting? Uh, I mean, what is the difference between this kind of work compared to the to the other one that it that maybe it's uh, much more easy to to sell or to yeah? Well, we try to bring it to the conversation as part of our programming or as part of um, special projects. Um, and some galleries take the risk of doing it in their booth. Um, I think it really helps the other works that are presented because it really reinforces a dialogue that is not just about the object. For example, last year we had a, a collaborative from um, Brussels. It's called Gallery. Gallery. Somebody that actually they would be interesting to invite here at some point because it's, a, it's, on, it's four members, but they have a very interesting project because they, um, they do everything that is, they, they don't make any objects. All the work they make is non-object. Uh, they're, they're not objects. But they, you can ask them to do for you whatever you want them to do or perform for you. And they have a menu that you can pick from and they will perform to you, but they don't sell anything, they don't have objects, not, nothing in the space, in the booth, in the space. 
And we did work with them. We brought them into Untitled this in December gallery. Um, I think I think we we tried to bring it into what we do. Um, I mean, as long as they know that if I be a collector, I will be buying an idea, because I think buying ideas is great. You know, get a certificate, you own this, and you can lend it to. 20 years from now, 10 years from now, you can lend it to, uh, to, an ex, to a curator that is curating a show that has to do with this, or you can lend it to... Um, and people are doing that more and more. They're buying ideas. Um, it's the same way people started collecting video. Not too many people were collecting video 20, 30 years ago, but now many, many people. It's, it's a medium that is highly collected now. There are many video collectors. So, I believe with time, people will be buying more and more this sort of, I don't know, whatever, idea that, and it's happening. Just buying it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.